All right, let's get this show on the road. Uh, welcome everybody to the inaugural session of our uh, lecture series entitled Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship Through an Interdisciplinary Lens. And uh, we have the great pleasure to open in this uh, lecture series uh, together here today. My name is Stefan Lavich, and this is my colleague, uh, Michael Fuchs. Uh, we are two parts of a project team uh, that also includes the Ola Moises Beach Lab here and Professor Roberta Meyerhofer, who's unfortunately not here today. Um, in terms of kind of spatial or physical structure, we should point out that we need to stick together because we only have one mic here, um, which might be a bit weird at times, but yeah, this is how it goes. Um, okay. There was a button, right. Uh, we are both from the, the Department of American Studies, which is actually right next door, basically, for those who, of you who actually don't study American Studies, uh, and also the Center for Inter-American Studies, since the project is actually located at the Center for Inter-American Studies, which is over in Merangasse, and the project, like the center, is directed by the absent Professor Meyerhofer. Um, this is like the first step of a one-year project that is funded by the Land Steiermark, um, I guess you can already move to the next slide. Uh, and which aims at uh, getting a sort of humanities perspective or uh, rather a humanities perspective and an interdisciplinary perspective on the, pr on the topic of entrepreneurship. In particular, we kind of want to infuse or inject an American studies uh, sort of perspective onto the topic of entrepreneurship because we believe, and so do the funders apparently of this project, that Entrepreneurship at its heart is a very American issue. Um, yes, of course, entrepreneurship is practiced across the globe, but as we will sort of detail a little bit later in this opening lecture, um, there is very, uh, entrepreneurship is kind of even in, written into the founding documents of the American nation at the end of the day, you could argue. So it's a very American topic issue. Uh, what we will thus aim to do for especially business people in Austria is kind of provide a sort of interdisciplinary or intercultural uh, translation work here because again we think or believe uh, that understanding American culture is key to actually understanding entrepreneurship and that is basically part of what this uh, lecture series is about sort of uh, providing different perspectives onto the topic of entrepreneurship from American studies, from uh, uh, group psychology, from business studies, of course, as well, uh, communication studies, law. Um, yeah, I think that's the folks that we have signed up for this uh, lecture series. Yes. Covers pretty much everything. Yes. That it does. Uh, I mean, you already said it in many ways. I mean, uh, there is something inherently or often believed to be inherently American about this entrepreneurial spirit. You know, it's, it, uh, entrepreneurship is in many ways en vogue, right? Every, um, you know, ever since, for the course of the last decade and a half or so, we've seen the startup craze, right? Everybody's talking about startups, getting their own businesses started. Usually, we might associate that a lot with, uh, with tech companies, right? Silicon Valley is usually one of those uh, lighthouse uh, models out there. But by now, you also have, uh, for instance, calls for teaching entrepreneurial skills to uh, kids in school so that they have the skill set uh, necessary to you know, be entrepreneurially active. Um, and what you said earlier is like, we still believe that you know, people might be able to you know, mimic or in, uh, uh, imitate the language of entrepreneurship. You know, uh, uh, like you know, the big names out there, whether it's Steve Jobs who's no longer with us or uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you name it. You might be able to uh, you know, imitate that language. But we think, particularly coming from the American studies point of view, that a lot of that is much deeper seated than just the language. Language plays a role in this, but we're talking about a, a multiple, well, basically a very complex culture of entrepreneurship. And uh, one of the uh, impulses that made us think about that a little bit more was uh, something that former executive director uh, uh, for Bright Austria, Dr. Lon Johnson, said uh, about a year and a half ago, saying that the uh, U.S. is one of the most uh, overexposed countries in the world, yet so many know so little about it. Um, and that's where we think we could come in with a little bit of help, into, uh, uh, kind of a uh, trans or intercultural, doing some intercultural translation work and facilitation. Um, right. 
And all of this is built into this project that we got going for uh, over the course of a year. So you're actually at the inaugural session of the one of a number of key actions that together uh, we'll, uh, we try to basically do this intercultural uh, translation work, uh, both in a science to science uh, dimension, as well as science to professionals, as well as science to public. Since this class is not only uh, for students who can take it for credit, of course, but it's also open to the public. So we have a number of uh, key actions. I don't know whether you want to uh, say a few things about the other key actions other than the lecture series. So we could we briefly go through the entire Right. Anyway. As you can see, we have the, or as you know, we have the lecture series now in this fall term, which are sitting in at the end of the day. We have uh, two seminars scheduled in the spring term, one of which will be on uh, entrepreneurial filmmaking, uh, and the other which, one of which will be, again, sort of feeding off this sort of lecture series, a sort of American pers studies perspective on entrepreneurship. Again, it will be a seminar for format and it will much more centrally be uh, on American studies uh, than this interdisciplinary lecture series. So there's that. Uh, at the end of the semester, we have planned a public round table with, uh, on the one hand, folks from the Center of Entrepreneurship, Professor Gutschelhoff, hopefully, uh, and the American ambassador, hopefully. Um, we have, and that's then the science to science part. What we have planned is a special issue of the Journal of the Austrian Association for American Studies, which will discuss um, uh, representations and simulations of entrepreneurship in American culture. We will sort of deal with that briefly uh, a little bit later in terms of the how uh, entrepreneurship is represented in popular media primarily. Um, and two more pieces are sort of on the fringes between uh, science to science and science to public in a certain way. Um, the first of which is, a, as you can see, a primer for the uh, Transatlantic Entrepreneurship Academy, which I hope all of you know is organized by the Center for Entrepreneurship. And you can actually sign up for next year's academy right now if you want to go to Montclair and, uh, and sort of uh, participate in an exchange with the, with the University of Montclair. Uh, go there for 10 days uh, and sort of exchange your thoughts on entrepreneurship, both with practitioners and students from the US. And finally, what we also have scheduled is an image film about entrepreneurship in Syria. Uh, sort of both uh, American entrepreneurs who sort of started businesses here in, in Austria and Syria more particularly, and uh, uh, Syrians who sort of either are global leaders in small niche markets or who kind of work with American topics. Like for example, some of you might know that diner that's actually in Gleisdorf, just an example. So a very American topic that turned into a, a product here in Austria. Yeah. And if there's any questions that you have, uh, you can always direct them to the two of us uh, under these two emails. Uh, we also wanted to go through a number of organizational items real quick since this class can be taken for credit by students also. Um, here's the lineup. You also uh, find that on the poster, which will all of that will go online along with uh, additional material. You might have already noticed that uh, th these sessions are, will be recorded. So for people who can't make it to individual sessions, you can basically rewatch them at home uh, and the material will go online on Moodle. We're also painfully aware that this is not online in Ugo, nor then also in Moodle yet, just yet, uh, because the powers that be work somewhat slowly. <laughs> so we're still waiting for the uh, course to actually be activated uh, in Ugo, but you can uh, also sign up uh, later, of course, since it's a lecture course. One thing we'll, we'll ask you to do, though, um, at this point, is uh, to possibly, if you could give us your names and your email addresses, whether or not uh, students or not doesn't matter. We just want to keep track of who's, uh, who's actually, oh, where's my pen? Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so that we can make sure that you all know what's going on after all of this has basically gone on. And lectures will be recorded uh, courtesy of the Center for Digital uh, Teaching and Learning who are making this uh, possible. Um, right. At the end of the semester, we will have uh, an exam since it's a lecture for those people who take it for, uh, for credit. Uh, we'll do it online based. It will be a Moodle uh, exam. Uh, the way we've uh, envisioned it is that for each and every session, there will be one question uh, that will be uh, answered, or have to, you, you guys have to answer that uh, in a short uh, answer, five to 10 sentences max. Uh, but then for all sessions, uh, you get to select essentially six out of those uh, 
how many are, are there? 12? 11, I or think. Or 11, 11 sessions uh, that represent essentially a mix of disciplines. So not just, uh, because with the first three sessions are more business oriented, and the other, uh, we then move to psychological dimensions, cultural and history, uh, historical dimensions. We also have one lecture on law, comparative law between you know, US American trade law, Austrian trade law. Uh, we'll actually talk a little bit about law today even. Uh, so uh, that will basically be the format of the exam and that will be uh, at the end of the term, the first two days that is. Anything you wanna add? Uh, what we have planned concerning still the exam I mean, you have it on the slide here that it will be open for one week. I, the exam will not take place at a specific time, but the exam will be open basically for the entire exam week and you can take the exam at any point during the final week of January. And you will then have 45 to 60 minutes to complete it. Answers in German and English are okay. So, so much for the uh, organizational meat and potato part. Uh, since we're a fairly small group today, uh, are there any questions about the organizational side of pragmatic issues? And I will begin my blast. I mean, we're usually either one of us or both of us will be here uh, at all the individual lectures. So, but if you have any questions, I will be doing my blast. And you can, I'll answer them. I'll try to answer. We will, know, we, we will touch base with you so that you know that everything is I guess correct. we will yeah. sign up the ones of you who's, who sort of feel, if you feel in your, your personal detail now, we will actually sign you up for the course. We can't sign you up for the exam yet though. That will take place later in the semester. <laughs> that depends on wh uh, which program you're in. Ultimately, once this goes online in the system, we'll, we'll see how, uh, uh, which program are you in? We're still sort of in discussions with the folks there, but it will probably only be a free elective for three ECTS points, probably. Most likely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, right. no, no, there should be more than one. No, that, again, but that, that is part of the, uh, the issue now with this class not being online, that we know which, which is, which you already started. <laughs> uh, yeah, other questions? we're doing, what we're doing, why we're thinking we as American trades people and a, uh, a couple other adjacent disciplines in the humanities should have a, a, a seat at the table of entrepreneurship and what we can actually bring to the table. In many ways, the two of us here uh, stand in front of you uh, as academic entrepreneurs because for us, projects like these are on the one hand a necessity, but also at the same time an opportunity. Um, I don't know, for those of you who are not in the humanities, perhaps you might not know that uh, it's it's a difficult way to make a living in many ways, right? Uh, humanities are not always considered, you could say, valuable perhaps, or you, uh, humanities contribute something that can be measured, for instance, as one of the main, uh, main challenges perhaps, but we don't necessarily, what we do, we don't necessarily conform to what is currently uh, basically the standard of, uh, or, or the contemporary discourse of ed academic knowledge production. Uh, because what we do usually cannot be expressed in monetary terms or indices or, or benchmarks. Uh, and thus some people, the powers that be, none of them are here today, um, uh, might uh, not see a lot of value in the humanities. Uh, because for the most part, yeah, the uh, main focus should, uh, right now is on the immediate applicability of knowledge, measurability, something you can quantify, for instance, uh, which, you know, is a bit difficult when you talk about cultural uh, questions. And uh, on the other hand, of course, a topic area like entrepreneurship is actually a wonderful 
opportunity, the topic itself and the topic area, uh, to you know, tap into interdisciplinary uh, expertise and humanities expertise. Um, so, uh, because you know, there are certain uh, factors that led to very pronounced entrepreneurism that runs through the entire fabric of American culture. Uh, so you, found, you find it at many, uh, many different levels, from the lemonade stands that kids put up uh, at garage sales every weekend, uh, to foundational charters of the United States that we'll, uh, we'll get uh, into. So in many ways, to quote one of uh, the sources that you'll find online later uh, on Moodle, in many ways it's culture, when we talk about uh, entrepreneurship and American entrepreneurship in particular, this an entrepreneurial spirit, it's culture all the way down. Uh, so we understand entrepreneurship when we approach this from our corner of the, uh, of the university, of the academy, uh, as interdisciplinary practice. And we in the humanities are usually pretty f uh, okay with complexities uh, and being okay and working with that and also bringing some complexity, quite frankly, uh, to this topic area of entrepreneurship. And I don't know how many of you might have made it to a high profile visit that we had last, uh, uh, last week, actually uh, last Friday, uh, the U.S. ambassador, the current U.S. ambassador uh, to Austria, uh, Trevor Trainer, uh, came and visited the university and particularly the Center for Entre uh, Entrepreneurship and, and Applied um, business. business. Thank you. Uh, applied business <laughs> is always a mouthful. Uh, and he had, uh, among a, a couple of things that he said, I mean, he told us a little bit about how he, he ended up uh, becoming ambassador. He's also self-proclaimed uh, serial entrepreneur, so he, uh, he has founded a, a series of companies. Uh, one more successful than the other in many ways. Uh, but one message that uh, kind of feeds into our project overall, and we felt like that's what we wanted to start off with, more common than he made. He said, like, America is a complex place, right? It's not necessarily just, you know, certain images that have come to mind. Actually, since we're such a small group, I would have, uh, would actually place it uh, to uh, put it to you. What are certain images that come to mind when uh, we talk about America? And perhaps specifically, well, any, anything at this point, because we'll talk about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs in a bit. Any images that you associate with America? Power. Power, all right. That's already at the heart of, what kind of power? Um, money power. Okay, all right. So economic power, all right. It's also entangled with political power and Military power, among other things? Uh, less use of resources. Okay, <laughs> so there, uh, if I were to rephrase that, so they're more willing to take risks. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll get to that, where that, where some of that comes from. Uh, because, yeah, uh, it's a long history of that, among other things. Okay, we already have a very informed audience <laughs> here, right? <laughs> I'm fascinated by a lot of what Elon Musk is doing. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, Elon Musk as what he's doing, what he's representing, the kind of visions, of course, that he that he uh, that he puts forth. Actually, we might actually uh, already, uh, uh, since we're already talking about those people, um, if we want to, you know, talk about faces you might all be familiar with, right? Elon Musk and and vis-a-vis -vis American entrepreneurship, right? There's Elon Musk, perhaps the types of you know, Steve, the Steve Jobs is essentially of this world. Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg, and there is, of course, a number of others. And those are uh, the people we're usually talking about right now when we, when we talk about entrepreneurship, particularly this entrepreneurial spirit that comes out of America and seems to be, in this case, also uh, kind of centrally located in Silicon Valley, among other things, right? Um, but in many ways, this is a bit of a very presentist uh, view because, for instance, the uh, when we're preparing for this, uh, what we're talking about uh, quite a bit as we're looking at the startup craze that we now have uh, the last, have had over the last decade and a half, and more and more people trying to also imitate what they're doing. So that's also part of what feeds into our project, trying to help people translate what that vi those visions, the activities that uh, people like Zuckerberg, for instance, are, are putting into action, uh, translate them across borders, right? Um, and there are certain challenges involved in this. So, uh, but one thing that we kept uh, coming back to when we were talking about these uh, people like that was uh, this is just the latest chapter in uh, a long history of where people like that, hero, entrepreneurial hero figures came out in America and, and 
did their thing. One particular time period that we can, uh, com kept coming back to is the late 19th century, early 20th century, and the famous, and that's what they were called, uh, captains of industry, people like J.P. Morgan, uh, John D. Rockefeller, for instance, right? Uh, and the, those are the hero figures within, uh, and I'm really talking about, people talk positively about them, they aspire to what they're doing, right? And those are cultural hero figures, and those are basically linked to very deep-seated uh, cultural processes. Um, right. We wanted to give you a few other stories that you might not have heard about, just to round things out a little bit, because uh, uh, and we've got, there's plenty. That's, that's the whole point. It's not just a recent phenomenon, on the contrary. And it permeates uh, all fabrics of life uh, in America. Um, and there is no clear model either. So the first is drawn from my own postdoctoral work in Western hats. John D. Stetson, I'm not sure whether you ever heard of the name or the guy, but I'm pretty sure everyone has seen cowboy hats or knows what a cowboy hat looks like. Uh, and uh, his story falls into this time period of the late 19th century. He was one of those captains of industry uh, um, that was just as uh, successful as the other bigger names that you might have heard about. So John B. Stetson uh, was a native of New Jersey, and he learned the hat-making trade from his father. Uh, he suffered from uh, tuberculosis uh, and traveled out west to the uh, uh, American West in 1860, to recuperate from tuberculosis. And he tried to, you know, try to uh, hand at different things, tried to uh, strike it rich by mining for gold. And he turned the need for uh, warm water repellent clothing into a business idea by making felt blankets and felt hats. So he took that idea back home with him. Uh, so pr a prospector turned entrepreneur, took it back to the East Coast and took out a small loan and started a uh, hat manufacturing business. Um, and then he went, what he did, he, of course he didn't invent the cowboy hat per se. Hats were out there, broad brimmed hats were already being worn out west, but what many entrepreneurs do, they innovate, of course. So it's not so much about inventing something, but really about you know, innovation, finding a new way to market something or improving something, for instance. And that's exactly what he did. He, uh, with his hat business, he went beyond the regional markets that most of his competitors usually cater to, tapped into uh, the technologies, the brand new technologies of the day, the telegraph, uh, uh, railroads, and basically supplied uh, wholesalers and merchants and mercantiles all over the nation with free samples of his products. And of course, if you have a hat that you can try on readily, you're much more uh, eager uh, to actually order one through mail order catalogs. Uh, and then he employed uh, Famous people at that time, people like Buffalo Bill Cody, for instance, that's a name that might, uh, might ring a bell, to promote his products and also bring that to the attention of the world. He showcased his hats uh, at the World Exhibition in France in 1899 and uh, actually won the exhibition's Best Hat uh, Award. And by 1900, believe it or not, Stetson owned the largest hat company in this world. Uh, and since then, Stetson as a brand has become synonymous with the object itself. So it's very much like Xerox or Kleenex, for instance. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, to visit with the folks from Stetson, or rather by now, Hatco uh, Corporation. And they're very much aware of the story and they're very much, uh, they employ it whenever uh, they, uh, they promote their products. All right, so that's a, an entrepreneurial story you might not have heard about before. Another uh, example, uh, Many call her the first, uh, but definitely she was among the first African-American entrepreneurs. Madam C.J. Walker, and her story is actually phenomenal, particularly uh, given the historical circumstances uh, that she found herself in. Again, this took place in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, after the Civil War, sl uh, slavery was abolished, but this did not mean that African-Americans were uh, free. There was rampant racism, of course, systematic segregation. Um, new forms of depend, uh, dependency, and lynchings were also uh, rampant. So in this, this was the environment that uh, uh, C.J. Walker was born into. Uh, she was actually born down in Mississippi in the Delta region, uh, was the daughter of former slaves uh, uh, working away in the sharecropping system. And her first husband was lynched, uh, and she relocated to St. Louis with her daughter uh, and worked as a washerwoman and as a cook. And due to poor hy hygienic conditions and a poor diet, she started losing her hair. 
And she started to experiment with homegrown uh, remedies. And later on in her, in her life, she recalled um, something that was revealed to her, at least according to her, uh, in a dream. And I want to, and this, uh, these are her own words, and this ties into one of the things we want to pick up on after this, this kind of entrepreneurial vision. And that's what, uh, that's what she had to say, quote, uh, a big black man appeared to me and told me what to mix up for my hair. Some of the remedy was grown in Africa, uh, but I sent for it, put it on my scalp, and in a few weeks my hair was coming in faster than it uh, had ever fallen out, unquote. So from there, she actually uh, started to uh, experiment with a couple of formulas for cosmetic supplements, hair products, skin products, uh, and while she also did not invent the straightening comb, straightening iron, she improved uh, the, uh, she actually designed a better model, and again, shows to, uh, speaks to this, uh, uh, entre the entrepreneur as an innovator. Uh, she moved to Denver, uh, where she established her own business, Madam C.J. Walker's Manufacturing Company, and making beauty, uh, beauty products, skin products, and uh, advertise them directly to the African-American market, which is essentially an untapped market at this point, using uh, African-American newspapers to get the word out and then have people um, order those uh, products through mail order catalogs. But she also traveled ceaselessly, door to door, promoted her wares at uh, church uh, um, groupings, at uh, different lodges, and she set up schools or training schools, if you will, where uh, she taught young African-American women the so-called Walker system as a way to basically uh, empower them, right? Escape uh, extreme poverty and also a, a male-dominated society. By 1914, her business was actually worth than a million dollars. Uh, that's a phenomenal uh, uh, at that time. Also, particularly uh, when we talk about an African-American uh, woman. And she left this legacy of entrepreneurial skill for the African-American communities that, that also showed that it's not just uh, white people, obviously, white men who can do that. Last example for this one, uh, we preface this with a little clip uh, um, for this one. It doesn't get more American than this entrepreneurial story because it uh, combines entrepreneurial acumen with something, uh, with an art form that is, well, it doesn't get more American than this, and this is country music. And there's a new story for you there. What you just heard here is two stories uh, intertwined in many ways. Edwin Craig uh, laid the groundwork for Nashville uh, to become Music City USA and also essentially helped to give birth uh, to country music. He uh, and his producers started this very popular uh, barn dance show called the Grand Ole Opry, which was uh, on the air every Saturday night. And it was uh, the most popular show right from the beginning uh, of their broadcast. And one thing, for instance, that the insurance uh, fo folks from the insurance uh, company then did was during the warmer months of the year in particular, they walked around towns all over the United States and were listening uh, uh, for who had uh, their radio tuned to the Grand Ole Opry. Come around Monday, you would have an insurance salesman uh, show up at your door and uh, ask them, oh, well, are you familiar with the Grand Ole Opry? I'm with the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, and it's like, yeah, they're big fans. And they, let me tell you about insurance, right? So that's basically uh, the idea. And it had a knockdown effect, of course, because uh, it proved to be very important uh, for the city of Nashville to attract music businesses, studios, um, uh, production companies, you name it. So it had a huge business impact. And then, of course, a huge cultural impact as well, because it is still uh, the Grand Ole Opry, the place, the Ryman Auditorium is uh, by now referred to as uh, the, the um, mother church of country music. So those are, again, very, much, uh, very different stories to what you might have heard about already. And that just goes to show that uh, entrepreneurial thinking, entrepreneurial acting uh, uh, is deeply woven into the American cultural fabric. You find it in, uh, in every corner of American society and throughout American history. So we keep coming back to this notion of uh, um, this being a cultural thing. So we, we figured we'd give you a brief primer of what we mean by that and what that actually translate into, uh, translates into the kind of work that we do as cultural studies people, right? Which, is a, which will be a very brief primer. Uh, uh, the one thing, the, the central idea that we want to drive home here today, but also then in the rest of the semester at the end of the day, is that from, from a cultural studies perspective, there's a clear difference between culture and what in German you call Kultur, which is high culture, you know, the arts, uh, painting, artworks, whatnot. 
culture in, in, in the center of cultural studies is the values, beliefs, myths that sort of circulate in, in a given community group. Um, and these values, myths, beliefs then fuel or feed into cultural productions like the artworks. So there, there's this sort of back and forth between cultural artifacts like artwork sort of representing certain myths and sort of feeding back into our understanding of these cultures. I.e., again, the most important idea to take away here is this sort of clear difference between culture and high culture. That culture is basically everyday practices, that high culture also includes our, our, uh, uh, how we eat, for example, uh, not high culture, culture. Uh, traditions and all these things are part of culture at the end of the day, that's the point here. And on, again, entrepreneurship, uh, American entrepreneurship in particular uh, feeds off certain ideas and, and myths that circulate in American culture. For example, the American dream, or as you were saying before, the willingness to take risks. All of these ideas and, and, and values feed into our, the American understanding of entrepreneurship at the end of the day. And hence, again, to repeat what we said before already, entrepreneurship is a, is an, is a cultural practice. And from this uh, uh, point of view, uh, things that might depending on where you come from, obviously you have different programs, uh, things like economics, for instance, or law, or even science is not separate from culture. It's co-constitutive of it. So it's part, everything is part of culture from this point of view. You know, different legal frameworks, this is just one example that uh, I keep coming back to, is different legal frameworks reflect uh, certain cultural values, right? That's why there are such huge differences between cultures that practice English common law versus culture here, for instance, based on Roman law. That's why we, all, among other things, also we have a legal scholar trying to help us navigate that, but from a cultural point of view. Um, and this is, uh, again, just to drive the point home without overselling the point, perhaps, uh, but this is where the humanities uh, can have a key role because central to the humanity is the human being, right? So this is where we see uh, our role in connecting or bringing disciplines that otherwise would not uh, have a lot to do with each other, actually bring them together at the, uh, at the same table. And in many ways, uh, I don't know how many of you are economics students ultimately, um, in many ways it's a bit of a heterodoxical in intervention that we're doing here also because in economics, the best we, uh, we know at least, there's still a dominant paradigm at place in neoclassical economics and its various permutations. Uh, but there's also other schools, of course. And Austria is a particularly good place because there's the Austrian School of Economics or we also have institutional economics uh, and also Joseph uh, uh, Schumpeter's work also would fall into that. Uh, so schools of thought, economic schools of thought, that actually focus on cultural dimensions rather than just um, supply and demand uh, calculations in very simple terms, of course. This is the humanities study scholar. It's just also a cultural phenomenon, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's where we see, uh, and that's why we're coming back to this quote uh, by, uh, I forget his first name, but Waller, who said, like, it's ultimately it's still all, uh, cultural all the way down. So economics, the way how we do business, the way how Americans do business is not separate from culture. And that's, this is where some of the miscommunication, misunderstandings, misconceptions do come in. Uh, and that's where some of the challenges of translating or adapting uh, this American behavior in many ways, or worldview, uh, uh, come in and become manifest. Uh, and this is where we want to help, honestly, and just, uh, uh, contribute to something to make that better or make it work better in a way. Um, so for the last segment of our talk, because we had a couple of wonderful responses that uh, point to risk, we wanted to actually take you on a little bit of a historic, uh, historical excursion even, uh, because what it boils down to is really a lot of cultural history. It explains in part uh, this thing that we call the American entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so we want to dissect two or three peculiarities uh, about this spirit, uh, certain tendencies and certain uh, conditions that are of distinct cultural nature and that cannot be easily cast into rational terms. So we're really moving to metaphysical planes even. Um, professor of Economics Jonathan Hughes wrote this uh, book that occasionally pops up when uh, people talk about American entrepreneurs and he gave us a starting point. Uh, yeah, it's a very long book, very lengthy elaboration on the role that the individual entrepreneur has had over the course of American history and how it's tied to American progress, 
uh, economic development. And he identified five functional stages that have been playing out over the course of uh, American history simultaneously. So it's not just from one stage to the other, it's all stages are happening at the same time with different people, different regions. Um, and entrepreneurial actors come out of these stages uh, and then do their work and then also recede again. Uh, and today, the one stage that, or functional category that he identified that we'll focus on the most uh, is idealism. So this, uh, this propensity to take risks, to actually go against convention, right? Uh, he talks of um, this uh, doing something that, quote, flies in the face of some sort of convention, right? When we hear the word convention or tradition, perhaps, or a certain attitude, that's automatically, the, that's a telltale sign that cultural processes are at work. Um, and this is where this American brand of idealism comes in. So this belief that we take this risk, right? Whereas we might not necessarily feel the same way being acculturated in a different culture. And we wanted to give you an example, perhaps an unexpected example, uh, from popular culture where you can find that brand of American idealism articulated. And this comes from uh, Star Trek, the original series, so way back when in the 60s, famous Starfleet captain James T. Kirk uh, articulates this particularly American brand of uh, idealism. Uh, so let's take a quick listen, a short clip. Yeah, I couldn't have, uh, I couldn't have thought of a better, better example uh, for, uh, uh, where you could easily see that idealism articulated in this one clip. So this all speaks to what he speaks to basically is this refusal of accepting a certain status quo, right? Uh, summoning this, almost in this case, also really a blind belief in actualizing something that doesn't exist yet, right? In other words, force a particular vision into, uh, into existence. And a lot of that is indebted to Calvinist discourse. So there's a lot of religion packaged into this. We have one talk, December 12th, by Daniel Shanahan, who will go into great detail about this. But we still figured we uh, wanted to give you a little bit of a brief preview uh, on that still, because that's one of those key key dimension, uh, religious dimension actually, uh, that uh, you need in order to unlock some of the American entrepreneurial spirit. And for that, we brought another clip from another documentary titled "The uh, The Men Who Built America." And Mike's got a few impulse questions for you, actually. Yeah, I'm just gonna play. I'm just gonna play the clip, and then we'll take it from there. So this is a clip that um, deals with. Uh, the early years of John D. Rockefeller. And this is a fairly cheap national, is it National Geographic, isn't it? History Channel. Oh, it's a History Channel, so it's a little bit popular. Risk is the Risk. Name of the game. <laughs> so the question basically is, since again, the, the group is so small, uh, for, or first of all, uh, putting a hat, that, that sort of cap of uh, the film studies scholar on here, uh, what we uh, as humanity scholars would do in the first place here is of course we would disentangle uh, the, the shot sequences, why certain music cues are used in certain, at certain times and whatnot. And I think this is very explicit here in this scene because as Steve was saying before, this is a history channel production and hence not necessarily highly complex. But uh, the question here again, since the group is so small, uh, how does this brief clip explain uh, why Rockefeller was willing to take risks? Right. Right. Very much so. There, there, there is this sort of notion of you know, to sort of make progress in a certain way. Economic progress in that case very much requires risk taking. And then what you have in the sort of if he's anticipated towards the end of the clip is that what you presented with then is sort of his life story, which is very much this uh, typical rags to riches story of the U.S. You know, he was the son of a, a gambler actually and whatnot. So he really came from, from the bottom of the social ladder and made it to the top, it's a very American story. But again, there is this notion that you need to take risk and be sort of uh, uh, um, going to the, uh, sort of venturing into unexpected territory in a certain way. You don't know what's out there, but you're still willing to take that step, step a certain leap of faith, if you will. You expect that something good will come out of it. And that's, I think the key word here is what you use is, is faith because entrepreneurship is not an act of reason. 
actually an act of faith, or the other way to put it, it's unwitnessed. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily a rational process from that point of view. And that has, it has a, a, a religious dimension to it. And this, again, the, the track record is uh, pretty, pretty long here. Uh, so there are spiritual sides to uh, economics and, and capitalism, if you will. I mean, you have it uh, in, uh, in Durkheim, for instance, he, he, he uh, wrote at great length about this connection between economic activity, uh, particularly entrepreneurial activity, and, uh, and, re uh, and religion, and a, a belief system that is akin to religion. And also uh, the fa father of the ca uh, capitalist system, if you will, uh, Adam Smith. Uh, one thing that a lot of people who are probably not working historically usually leave out is that prior to him uh, writing The Wealth of Nations, he wrote a lot about Christian morality. So that informed all of uh, his later uh, works. So when he talks about you know, uh, someone entering a business venture through self-interest, which is of course uh, a key difference to selfishness, there is a spiritual dimension to that. Um, and again, believing in something uh, that doesn't exist yet with the hope or the potential for future uh, uh, payoff. Uh, which gets us to this very long history that we have in the United States of settler colonialism, and particularly Anglo settler colonialism, which is uh, entangled uh, with the spiritual uh, dimension. So, um, this long history of Anglo settler colonialism in, in North America in particular enables certain uh, entrepreneurial tendencies, thanks to the structural foundation that's been in place for. 300 plus years or so. So we're talking about uh, basically uh, certain human liberties, uh, more liberties that you would find in Europe at that time. So we know that's all very relative. Liberties and protections, particularly protection of private property, not just uh, uh, your own home, for instance, your own uh, state, but also intellectual property in the long run. Uh, and a firm belief in the social contract and contractual obligations and, uh, and enforcement of those contracts. So this has been in place since the beginning, essentially, of uh, the Anglo conquest. So add two, uh, 300 plus years and you arrive at where, uh, where we're at. So we, we're talking about 300 plus years of acculturation. So that's why this is so deeply baked into, into the system. Uh, and we do have a few examples. I don't know whether you want to add really early historical examples where you can see that. So many, many of the colonies uh, early on were essentially uh, founded, of course, as business ventures, or at least partial business ventures. And you find the early seeds of this spirit, if you will, already in uh, explorers and conquerors reports like John, uh, John Smith's in his uh, uh, description of New England, published all the way back in 1616, where he already talks about, again, the potential of that this, uh, the potential that this place holds, and that one may go there if you're willing to risk it. Because, you know, crossing the, uh, the oceans and starting out new and that, uh, and this, particular period was anything but easy, right? You have to have a lot of faith in actually in order to do that. Uh, and most people did not make it, so that's the other thing. Uh, and what was the worst case scenario in this case? Death, obviously. So you really have to believe quite a bit in your own abilities, uh, but also in the potential outcomes. Um, and later on, the poster child of, uh, let's say, uh, rags to riches story, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who's in many ways, the great-grandfather of the self-made man, uh, who at one point uh, after the American Revolution wrote this pamphlet, which was actually a sales pitch to people in Europe, why people uh, and what kind of people also should think about relocating to the United States. And again, he stresses that you know it's not a place for the idle, but if you're willing to work and willing to work hard, if you bring certain skills, not necessarily being super learned, so having a school education is not necessarily not absolutely necessary, something that the ambassador also mentioned uh, at last week's talk. He said like, he's appreciative of the fact that he went to business school, but he was not entirely sure as to how much he benefited from that. Uh, that's another thing that someone like uh, Benjamin Franklin actually touched upon. He's like, you know, we don't necessarily need a lot of uh, learned people right away, but people who are willing either to learn a trade, for instance, uh, or are already artisans, you know, carpenters, for instance, uh, who could really make their way by working hard and, and, and working their way up the ladder, become, as he put it, respectable citizens. So it's very much uh, tied into also what makes you an American. So uh, that's part of that. Um, 
the outlines. And, yeah, it's, it was a bit too long to put it on one slide. Uh, but he restates again that if you do this, the chances of you improving your, uh, uh, your status in life are definitely a lot higher than in Europe. So because that's what makes uh, what is possible in America. And all of this is enshrined in the foundational texts of the United States. So and within the US American uh, context, almost sacred uh, texts. For instance, the Declaration of Independence is written or infused within uh, entrepreneurial discourse. Um, thinly veiled, you have this, those inalienable, uh, inalienable rights uh, that all are uh, guaranteed, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, the pursuit of happiness was, in many ways, just a cheap uh, uh, plagiarist uh, act, also on, on behalf of Thomas Jefferson. But what he meant by uh, the pursuit of happiness uh, is uh, basically formations of like money, property, but above all else, wealth. Wealth and the pr uh, pr legal protections of wealth. Uh, in order to improve your social standing. So that's baked into this. And we also have a pointer to this uh, notion of risk taking um, uh, with a hope for future rewards. Uh, the, uh, the people who signed the declaration, signed it, uh, that, that's a concluding paragraph, signed it by mutually pledging to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And all you have to do is, uh, who uh, is asked who wrote it. Uh, those who essentially uh, were threatened by British reforms and particularly uh, levying of taxes. So those people who stood or who, who, who basically yeah, stood to lose the most if those reforms uh, uh, continued. And also those people who, uh, who had most to gain by changing uh, the government. So the founding fathers were essentially just practicing their uh, uh, rights as natural born Englishmen and decided basically explain to the world why it becomes necessary to uh, change their form of government and improve their state, uh, station ultimately and the station of the nation which was uh, about to be formed. So they took a personal risk. So again, back to lives, fortunes, and their sacred honor. And who were those people at that point? Wealthy, white landowners, merchants, and lawyers. Those are the people who stood the most to, uh, to lose and also uh, stood the most to gain ultimately. Right, but again, that's just the beginning or still part of the beginning of the story uh, because one thing that uh, we also like to do in the humanities is add a little bit more criticism even uh, uh, to something that is usually celebrated and celebrated without question even. All right, I'm just gonna hit it off with a clip. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, um, as you can see that this is sort of, uh, sort of a couple of minutes, actually only later in the clip that we watched before about Rockefeller's life. Uh, and here, as you can see, uh, here is Rockefeller sort of coming to understand that oil is the future in a certain way. And this is underscored by the music and also the way in which it is shot and whatnot. So this is very bombastic and ce celebrates Rockefeller at the end of the day and his visionary uh, character. But of course, it's the beginning of oil culture. Uh, and from a humanities perspective, this is of course very problematic in a number of ways. Um, um, I'll draw here, I'll just briefly sketch um, Jason W. Moore's book, Capitalism in the Web of Life. We, uh, Jason Moore is a sociologist, a Marxist sociologist. And as a Marxist soci sociologist, he is of course very critical of the entire capitalist system, as you can imagine. And he argues that, quote here, the accumulation of capital is the multiplication of the proletariat is the appropriation of unpaid work and energy. This unpaid work energy extends to the whole system of cheap nature. So basically what he says here is very much that the entire capitalist system is founded on exploitation. You don't pay your workers and the, the easiest thing to exploit at the end of the day is nature because it doesn't have any agency. Um, which, uh, uh, Another uh, sociologist named Justin McPrine has taken another step, this sort of idea where he argues that capitalism actually was born from extinction. This actually draws on Marx who argued that capitalism is a vampire. Um, capital, he continues, feasts on the dead and in doing so devours all life. The deep time of past cataclysm becomes the deep time of future catastrophe. And if you look 
at that uh, caricature here, what would you say does McBride actually mean by these couple of sentences? Or what can you equate those two sentences with? If he says, capitalism was born from extinction. Where does oil come from? That matter at the end of the day. And the criticism is very much uh, targeted at the entire petromodern system, as it's called, the, the system that's based on fossil fuels. Fossil fuel depends on death at the end of the day, and it will create death in the future, as we can see from the environmental dilemma that we're all in right now. We won't end on this happy note. No, it won't, but it's still <laughs> about briefly about uh, idealism and this blind belief that things will go on the way they've always uh, uh, gone on, right? So again, as if there is no, uh, as if there is an infinite amount of resources available. So again, the whole logic right. of particularly entrepreneurial uh, action within American context in particular, this blind belief that whatever it is that is not there yet in the future can be wrestled out of that future, can be actualized, in part is always uh, uh, tied to natural resources. Uh, at, at the moment, we only have the resources of one planet uh, available to us. So this is usually, again, part of the equation that is left out when we have those celebratory, bombastic, and um, um, entrepreneurial success stories, right? So that's when we enter the uh, area of sustainable entrepreneurship. So how can we still act as entrepreneurs at the same time also trying to avert the necrosy. Always circumvent it. Impossible. Or impossible. Some people say it's impossible. Um, true. So, but that's the moment we find ourselves in. But like, uh, like you said, we don't necessarily want to uh, end in such a necrotic uh, <laughs> thing. Um, coming back to uh, this whole notion of uh, the American entrepreneurial spirit being basically part of the cultural DNA of all uh, one quote that is often misused, actually, when uh, people quote from American sources is something that uh, uh, President uh, Calvin Coolidge supposedly said at one point, and that is that a business, the business of America is business. This is slightly, mis uh, slightly misquoting the president, who actually stated the following in a speech to a news trade group, uh, which he talked about the news media and the free, uh, and the free market. That was 1925, and he said, like, quote, after all, the chief business of the American people is business. They're profoundly concerned with producing, buying, selling, investing, and prospering in the world. Um, so, again, coming back to this notion that the American entrepreneurial spirit permeates American culture left and right, every single corner, uh, whether it's ethnic minorities or white mainstream culture, from the all-American lemonade stand that you still find uh, uh, at every corner, when you go out to, uh, to garage sales or yard sales on the weekends, you find that there. It, people, kids practice that, essentially, it's an entrepreneurial act. From there, all the way to the self-proclaimed deal maker and business genius that got elected uh, to the Oval Office in 2016. So you have this uh, run through all of this. And we found yet another wonderful example of uh, this uh, out of the old window house. American uh, sports uh, culture enthusiasts, if you will, kind of encapsulates that in it quite succinctly. So it's all about people, and that could be a better segue to our uh, actually upcoming session next week already, where we have uh, Ben Habiba from the Center for Entrepreneurship and, uh, and Applied Economics. Business. Oh, business. See, I keep get, uh, getting it wrong. Uh, come in and actually talk about uh, entrepreneurship. It's all about people. Because all we gave you today is essentially you crack wide open a number of questions that we'll try to answer and work through over the course of the semester, having people from different disciplines actually weighing in and trying to dissect even more and actually explain what we simply teased here. So we, we know that this was a bit of a tour de force run through of American culture, history, society, um, and a dose, a healthy dose of American popular culture. And with that, I think uh, we'll conclude it for now. And we'll see you next week. And if you have any questions, since we're a pretty small group, and we still got a, a bit of time, we'll be happy to.
try to answer them and hang around. Other than that, we hope that we'll see y'all uh, next week. And tell your friends. <laughs> and tell your friends. <laughs> uh, so we'll kick out with the full, uh, full-blown lecture.